All right, welcome back from the break. Um, so before the break, we looked at three implications of what adoption uh, would mean for us being adopted children of God. Um, let's move on to another concept related to this whole topic of salvation. Um, in your notes, you have, uh, I think, about four or five things which we can receive as a result of our salvation experience. Uh, so, you know, the, there's some explanation given about what that word, Greek word, so so stands for. So, uh, the word salvation, or rather the word getting saved, wherever that word saved is being used in our New Testament, in most of those places, it's that word so so the Greek word sozo, which is used to uh, talk about this particular word. Uh, so in Greek, it's just S-O-Z-O. -O, but you know, when you're pronouncing it, you're supposed to kind of put in a D over there. So it's sozo. Yeah. So, um, so there are five, at least five basic things that we um, can understand regarding this particular Greek word. The first, maybe we can look at as an example, would be Matthew 1, 21. If someone could read out Matthew 1, 21, we will see in what way this word sozo is used over here in this particular verse, Matthew 1, 21. Matthew 1, 21. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It says that he will sozo his people from their sins. So over here it's talking about in what way is he sozoing them? In what way is he saving them? He will forgive their sins and make them part of God's family. So the, the first privilege which salvation gives us is that it will uh, provide us with forgiveness of all our sins. So we will be set free from our sins. So the first privilege that Sozo gives us is, you know, redemption from our sinfulness. The second privilege which we see, um, maybe we could look at Ma Mark 6.56. Yeah, if someone could read out Mark 6.56. Mark 6, 56, wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Yeah, so here it says, all who touched, you know, the edge of his cloak were sozo. They were healed. They were made well. So over here, which aspect of salvation is being talked about? It's talking about physical healing. So through salvation, we have complete forgiveness of sins. Through salvation, we also have access to physical healing. A third privilege that Sozo offers, um, Luke 8, 36. If someone could read out Luke 8, 36. Luke 8, 36. They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed. Yeah, so here it talks about how the demon possessed man had been sozo. So over here it's talking about deliverance from demonic oppression of any kind. So uh, uh, deliverance from demonic powers is the third privilege that we gain through salvation. A fourth thing, uh, Matthew 8, 25. Matthew 8, 25. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. So they are saying to the Lord, Lord, so so us, we are going to drown. And so here, this word so so is being used to talk about uh, protection, 
deliverance, rescue from physical danger. And then you have a fifth uh, sense in which this word is used. That would be in Matthew 9.22. Matthew 9, 22, but Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman she made well from that hour. Yeah. Um, so here it's um, the woman was sozo at that moment. Uh, Jesus says, your faith has sozo you, your faith has healed you. And the woman was sozo, she was healed at that moment. Uh, now, in some of the translations, this is translated as, she was made well. Um, I was looking at the way the different you know, English translations have translated this particular word. I noticed that for, in some places, they use the word healed. But in some particular verses, they use the word made well. And it's the same word which they are translating. I mean, there's no difference in the in the Greek word. The Greek word is so so. So I was kind of wondering why is there a difference in the way they translated? They could have used made well in all the places, or they could have used healed in all the places. Why the kind of you know difference in translation? And then when I was looking at one of the commentaries, this is what they had written. In some cases, it was not just physical healing which that person received. That physical healing, it kind of gave them back a new life. You know, I mean, they were in such a bad state that that one act of healing just didn't simply take care of something that was physically wrong. It actually restored back their life to them. They were made well in the sense they were made whole. They were made complete. So. Um, I think wherever they wanted to bring out that deeper emphasis of that word, they tended to you know, translate it in English as made well. So here when it's talking about this woman who had the issue of blood, uh, so it says that she was made whole. She was made complete. Because even though she was alive, you know, she was just confined to her home. She could never go out anywhere. You know, uh, the, the rest of the family would not want to associate with her or touch her. She is, all, even though she's alive, it's like as if she's dead. You know, she's in that kind of a condition. So what Jesus did for her didn't just simply bring some physical relief. It, in fact, gave her back her life. It actually created a future for her. And so I kind of started looking for verses which had this term, you know, this particular uh, translation made well. And I saw that it is generally used for people who were in a very bad condition and it helped restore their life. Uh, in Luke 17 verses 15 to 19, it talks about lepers, you know, who were outcasts. They were uh, supposed to live outside the city limits because inside the city limits, if they touch anyone, that person will become unclean and they would have to undergo a complicated you know, uh, uh, purification ritual. So these people were made to stay outside. So imagine they didn't have access to the norm normal everyday life which other people did. So in Luke 17, 15 to 19, these lepers, they come to Jesus and they ask him to heal them. And then uh, they all get healed, only the Gentile among them only he is grateful and he comes back to Jesus to thank him. And so at that point of time, Jesus says to him in Luke 17, 19, then Jesus said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This man who had no future, who had nothing to look forward to, the rest of his days is just going to be living over there with the other lepers outside the city limits with no, um, no kind of you know, uh, fulfillment, no sense of purpose. No, nothing. So this man, he received much more than just a healing from a skin condition. His future was restored back to him. The same thing we see even in another place, uh, Luke 18, 40 to 43. This is basically the blind beggar who is sitting on the side of the road. And when he gets to know that it is Jesus who is walking by, he gets really excited and he starts shouting loudly, saying, you know, Lord, please help me. And when he is shouting loudly, Jesus comes to him. And in Luke 18, verse 42, Jesus said to him, receive your sight. 
your faith has uh, you know made you well so um, in all these places people who never even had a future were made whole they got back their life so much more than physical healing took place you know in these cases so uh, look at these five things which salvation has offered us we are forgiven from all of our sins you know even as we talked about it uh, even under the heading of justification and not only that we can go to him with confidence for our physical healing we don't have to wonder will i be healed or will i not be healed have you been given salvation has the lord granted you sozo if he has then if you stand on his scriptures and if you you know um, wage your spiritual warfare standing on the scriptures believing in them and claiming them then you are meant to have your physical healing in the same way even if there is any kind of demonic oppression that you're facing in your life where the demons are trying to you know trouble you or upset you or oppress you in some way then you can claim deliverance because of what sozo is offering you and we can even ask the lord for deliverance from physical danger we can ask the lord to protect us from harm from any kind of physical harm and if we are in a position where our life has been taken away from us a future you know there's no hope for the future things are so bad that we are wondering whether we can ever get back on our feet sozo applies even to such situations so the salvation that we have promises us this these five things so if we have experienced the salvation of the lord we can claim these five things for our own lives okay so um that's the comfort that we can have from our salvation experience um let's look also a little bit at the whole uh, concept of redemption uh, this is uh, again this this too is mentioned in your notes and you have a lot of greek words being mentioned over there in your notes so maybe we will look at a few of those um we we can uh, start off this talk about redemption with the uh, revelation 5 9 2 10 what is said over here in these verses about uh, redemption revelation 5 9 and 10 revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to god by your blood out of every tribes and tongue and people and nations and have made us king and priest to our god and we we shall reign on the earth all right so here we see in this passage it says with your blood you redeemed for god persons from every tribe in the niv it says purchased that uh, um that jesus has purchased us for god and what with, with what purpose did he purchase us so that we can become a kingdom uh, of priests to serve him so it talks about uh, purchasing us this was a common word which was used back in those days it's the greek word agorazo that word just basically means buying something purchasing something you can go to the market and buy uh, you can go to the market and agorazo a bunch of apples it's just a normal word where you're saying that you're, you're buying something you're purchasing something and jesus did this for us he purchased people so that uh they can belong to his kingdom and serve as priests in his kingdom so where was the need for this whole purchasing to be done that's because of, you know we had become slaves we know the background to this um when adam and eve sinned they stopped being living spirits because they lost their connection with god 
they stopped being living spirits and they instead became sinful fallen spirits so once they became sinful fallen spirits and their connection with god was broken now they were in an exposed condition they were in a vulnerable condition where anyone powerful can take advantage of them and so when they were in this helpless condition you know their connection with god is lost when they were in this helpless condition satan comes and takes over god did not say please go and take control of the people it is satan without any legal authorization he chooses to take control of the people and make them his slaves so it's the it's the lack of connection which adam and eve had with god you know they lost their connection with god they became sinful fallen spirits when they were in that condition satan takes advantage of them and he makes them you know his slaves so in that way people went into slavery they became slaves of sin once they were slaves of sin satan could take over and control them and make them his slaves so people became slaves of sin and of satan in this manner so adam and eve they broke the law of god and that led to slavery the same thing we see even with the people uh, who the israelites you know with whom god made a formal covenant so according to the law of moses they were given many laws to follow when they failed to follow those laws they also became slaves of sin then what about the gentile people who are not part of any mosaic covenant so can the gentiles say we have not broken the mosaic law it's true that the gentiles were not under the mosaic law but then they had another kind of law which was written on their hearts that is what it says in romans chapter 2 verses 12 to 15 so even the gentiles because they disobeyed the law which was written on their hearts they also became slaves of sin so people from the time of adam up to the time of the mosaic covenant all of them broke the law of god those who were under the covenant they broke the covenant law of god as for the gentiles they broke the law which was written on their hearts so all of humanity in one way or the other because they have broken god's law everyone became a slave of sin and of satan um so it talks about okay maybe we can come to that verse later so yeah so so to 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 deliver these people who have become slaves of sin a price had to be paid and jesus was willing to do this now what would you say would you say that jesus paid this price to satan and said you know i want to buy back these people from you or did jesus pay this payment to god because it is satan who has made himself the slave master so will jesus pay the ransom price to satan or would god or or would jesus pay the ransom price to god satan never had legal authority over us god never said to satan you go and take control of the people of adam and eve and the rest of people of the people simply because the people belong to the creator okay so the creator god is the owner of all human beings and human beings chose to rebel against their master their creator master and so they lost their connection with him and they exposed themselves to danger so when they were in this vulnerable condition satan came and took advantage of their helplessness and made them his slaves but he is not their legal slave master sin is the legal slave master satan has only taken advantage of this helpless people so when jesus christ paid the ransom he paid it to the legal master they were in debt to their legal master their legal creator you know had a right to their obedience he had a right to their loyalty they chose to deny that loyalty and that obedience to him 
and so they owed him a legal debt they were obligated to obey him when they failed to obey god they now came under legal debt to god and so they were legally indebted to the lord and so the price had to be paid to the to yahweh to the lord so jesus christ paid the ransom price not to satan but to the legal master god because these people who rebelled against him were now in legal debt you know um so it is from um it is from satan that god has redeemed us that jesus has redeemed us but the ransom price was not paid to satan but to god himself okay so we would we would have to understand that the legal authority rested with god the father and he is the one who was declaring judgment against us so he is the one who had to be appeased he is the one who had to be satisfied so the price was paid to him and uh, uh, satan is just somebody who came in between and took advantage of the situation um so in your notes it talks about four or five things that we were redeemed from when jesus purchased us when he agorazo us there are four or five things from which we were liberated you know there were there are different greek words which are used to bring out um different aspects of this redemption you know when we looked at uh, at salvation just a little while ago we looked at the different uh, that how that one word has got different meanings over here when it comes to redemption many different greek words are used but they all are talking about different aspects of redemption so we look at a few of those verses so the first thing that we have been redeemed from um maybe we can look at galatians chapter 3 verse 13 galatians 3 13 galatians 3 13 christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having be having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is every one who hangs on a tree so when adam and eve broke god's law when the people of israel broke the covenant mosaic covenant when the gentiles broke the law which is written on their hearts when the, all of these people broke the law of god a curse came upon them the curse is the curse of judgment the wrath of god that is the curse which has come upon all the law breakers and so the first thing which jesus did is that he has redeemed us from this curse um so here in this particular verse it's not agorazo which is mentioned the word which is mentioned here is exagorazo it's a it's a variation of the basic word purchase um so to use an example if you were to go to the mall and buy a pair of earrings so you would basically be going to the mall and you will be agorazo purchasing buying the set of earrings on the other hand you go to the mall and you're just looking at you know uh, uh, the different um, you know um, uh, items of jewelry which are there and then you look at a pair of earrings and you realize that is that is your pair of earrings which somebody had stolen from your house 3 years back and now that exact pair is sitting over there it's actually your property it's yours it belongs to you your grandparents had gifted it to you but it was stolen from your house and now in some manner that earrings is now sitting over there in the shop now you can't exactly you know explain to the shopkeeper and say this is actually my property give it back to me so you are willing now to buy back what belongs to you so agorazo is just purchasing something exo exagorazo has this additional you know um, aspect of buying back something not just buying something but buying back something which originally belonged to you so humans originally belonged to god and they separated themselves from god so now jesus wants to buy them back for himself even though it's going to cost a lot is willing to make that investment so which is why you know this is explained to us uh in what way he does it that it's that's explained to us in colossians chapter 2 verse 
verses 13 to 15. So in Colossians 2, 13 to 15, it doesn't use the word exagorazo, but it brings out what exactly Jesus did for us. So let's look at Colossians 2, 13 to 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by considering the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He discerned the ruler and authorities and put them to open sin by triumphing over them in him. All right. So here in Colossians 2, 13 to 15, it says that Jesus forgave us all our sins having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness. So all of us are debtors. We owed God our obedience and our allegiance and our loyalty, we, but we refused to give him what we owe. So we became indebted to him. There's a legal debt hanging over our heads and the price has to be paid. Jesus chose to pay that price for us. So it says that he, um, he cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So it's like as if, you know, you have that legal document which shows that you owe God this much debt. You know, you have committed, let us say, a billion sins. So now you owe God, you know, uh, the price for those for those billion sins which you have committed. So that legal document contains all your debts against God. Every time you disobeyed him, every time you rebelled against him, every time you, know, uh, you went against what God wants, all of your legal debts are there on, on that legal document. It's like as if God is, Jesus has now taken that legal document, nailed it to the cross and paid the price for it by dying on that cross. So he has taken the, uh, the, you know, the punishment and he has paid the debt which you actually should have paid. So this is what he has done. So in that formal legal way, he literally took the curse and the judgment on our behalf. So he has ransomed us. That word exagorazo would be talking about how he has purchased back by cancelling that debt now we have been reunited with god okay so that's the um, that, that that's the term which is used in galatians 3:13 where it says that christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law so we are no longer cursed we are now under the blessing and protection of god um, let's look at another word that is used which talks about redemption um, that would be romans chapter 5 Verse 11. Romans 5 11. Romans 5 11. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. It says here that through Jesus, we have now received reconciliation. That Greek word that is used over there, that's supposed to be the Greek word. Katalaj. Okay, I really don't know any Greek, so forgive my pronunciation. Um, that's K A T A L L A G E. So through Jesus Christ, we have now received Katalaj or reconciliation. This Greek word is bringing out something very nice. Okay, so that's a word which was used for, in, in terms of money exchange. You know, I mean, you want to go to Canada, you go there uh, to Canada and you give your rupee notes. You know, no one's going to accept it over there. 
because they have their own Canadian ca currency. So you would have, first of all have to uh, you know exchange your Indian currency with the Canadian cur currency, and only then you can have transactions over there. So this is that kind of a word. So you know you in um, all these Jewish people who have been scattered all over uh, the Mediterranean uh, you know uh, region. Uh, some of them are living in Babylon. Some of them are living in uh, Egypt. So, so at least once a year they would make that effort to come all the way to Jerusalem to the temple of God and make their sacrifices over there, you know, for the forgiveness of their sins. So at least once a year, all faithful Jews would make that journey and come to Jerusalem. So when they come, when they arrive in Jerusalem and they have to buy the, you know, the bull and the lamb and all those uh, animals which they need, they need to purchase, they can't exactly use their Babylonian currency. They would have to use the local currency. So they would go to the money exchange guy you know, the, 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 the word that is used in the New Testament is money changers. So they would go to them and then those guys would take one commission for themselves and then, you know, pay the uh, rest. So that word katalash basically, basically is talking about exchanging an equivalent value. I give you this much rupees and then you give me this much pounds or this much dollars. You give, you give me an equal value of that currency. In the same way, this is what, you know, Jesus has done for us. Through Jesus, we have now received this kind of an equal exchange. That word reconciliation, that Greek word katalash, which is used over there, that word, uh, you know, which is translated as reconciliation, it literally means this. An equal exchange took place. What is this equal exchange? Jesus takes our wrath and our judgment and our punishment and in exchange, we are given his righteousness. Okay, so uh, the exchange, the equal exchange is all of the anger of God. All of the wrath of God should have come upon us. And now he takes that upon himself. And in exchange, he gives us all of his righteousness. You know, doesn't keep back any of it. All of the righteousness of God has now been given to us. So it's quite a amazing exchange i mean god jesus didn't get anything good out of it and we got all of the privileges you know of it so we, that kind of a full complete exchange was done and that is translated in our english as reconciliation where every last bit which needed to be covered jesus has fully covered he took the full punishment and he has given us his full righteousness. So now there's no nothing lacking. And I was reading a book the other day, and um, there was this one sentence that I read, which stuck in my mind. It said over there, all of God's ammunition against you has been expended. You know, it's like as if you know God had a rifle in his hand, and I know rifle basically you know has there are many bullets. Uh, so it's like every single bullet in that rifle has been used shot into Jesus. No bullets are left to you know hit you. All the ammunition of God, all the anger of God, all the judgment of God has already been expended upon Jesus. God has no bullets left to hit you. He's not angry with you. He will never be angry with you. He will correct you. He will rebuke you. But he's no longer displeased with you. So you can just confidently go into him knowing that he's not waiting over there with a gun and a bullet. There are no bullets left. All of them were already, you know, uh, launched into Jesus. All the wrath of God was, was, you know, um, poured out upon him. Now we only have the favor of God, the love of God, and the loving rebuke of God. So, you know, we can go to him with confidence, knowing that God doesn't hate us. He doesn't look down on us because we failed. He is open uh, towards us and he looks upon us with favor. So that is the kind of amazing reconciliation which is being talked about in our Romans 5 verse 11. Let's look at another word, uh, you know, that uh, brings yeah, out. Sister. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I would like to know, yep. uh, in respect to reconciliation, if mm. a believer does something wrong, Hmm. 
what happens in that case? Because we don't believe in uh, one save forever save. We mm. don't believe in that. So if a believer does something wrong, what happened to his status in respect to God? So we kind of talked about that uh, when we were looking at justification. Uh, at the moment of salvation, all the past, present and future sins of the person already stood forgiven. So when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, all of your sins, even the ones which you're going to commit in future, uh, have are forgiven by that one sacrifice of Jesus, which he did you know, long, long ago. And uh, so all the sins stand forgiven. But like it says in 1 John 1, 9, we cannot deceive ourselves and tell ourselves that just because all my sins have been forgiven, now I am sinless, that would be a lie. So John tells to his writers, do not deceive yourself by saying to yourself that now you are you, you have no sin in you. If you sin, humble yourself, go to God, confess that you have sinned. And then when you confess and repent, he is just, he is faithful, he will forgive you. So um, reconciliation is a one-time thing which happened. Uh, maybe you could equate it with the word justification. So we were reconciled with God at the moment of salvation. But after salvation, yes, there are many times we still fall because of our unrenewed mind and the, you know, the old sinful habits of our body. So we may go back into sin. When we do that, rather than pretending that we have not sinned, it is good for us to humble ourselves and go to him. And he is just and he is faithful and he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness is what it says. So this is something that we, we, we do with the Lord on a day-to-day -day basis. We, uh, we, we go to him each time that we sin. So that reconciliation and justification is something that happened at the time of salvation. And like we looked at from you know, those three passages, the two Hebrew passages and the Peter passage, there is a warning issued that a person can go to an extent where they can lose this reconciliation, but it does not happen lightly. So we looked at all those details. So I, I would say that that is basically how uh, reconciliation applies to the believer. Any follow-up questions that you would have? Or is that OK? Thank you. All right. Thank you. So yes. Um, Another word that is used, you know, with regard to our redemption, uh, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. If someone could read out, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, so in English, again, the word redemption is used over here. But in the Greek, it's a different word. The word over there is um, apolutrosis. Okay, so now this particular word talks about how something which was lost is now being restored to its to its former status okay so it's, it's actually a very nice word you're buying something and you're restoring it back to its original position so uh, that is the word which is used over here in whom we have redemption what kind of a redemption do we have we have an apolutrosis kind of redemption where earlier you know we adam and eve used to belong to god they were regarded as children of god they lost that status. They went into the kingdom of darkness. But now, you know, Jesus, it says in Colossians 1.13, that Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and he has brought us back into the kingdom of his son. Because that's basically where Adam and Eve were originally. They were in the kingdom of the son. And now they, you know, humans have been brought back to that kingdom if they choose to place their faith in the Lord Jesus. So, uh, uh, the previous status which we had has been restored by the ransom which was paid. 
uh, that's a, that's a third way in which you can look at this uh, you know uh, the way in which this concept of redemption is talked about in the scriptures uh, let's look at another uh, word another greek word which talks about redemption titus chapter 2 verse 14 titus 2 14 That is chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own position who are jealous for good works? All right. So here it says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness the greek word used over here is lutro which basically means to set free to set a captive free so jesus gave himself for us to set us free from all wickedness we were captives we were slaves of wickedness but now we have been set free okay so that's another word that is used for redemption um, let's move on from there into Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Galatians 1, 3 to 4. Galatians 1, 3 to 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our love, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. That word that is used over there to deliver us from this present evil age, that basically would be a word which talks about rescuing someone. You know, they're in danger and now you have, you know, you have paid the price and you have rescued them from that place. So here it talks about how we have been rescued from the present evil age. Everyone who's living in this world thinks that the world is a very nice place to be and they can do whatever they want and get away with it. But we know it's a very dangerous place to be. So this, so we are people who are being rescued from this present evil age, so that we will not end up the way the other people are going to end up. So uh, oh, that that word that is used over there is e x a i r e o. So we have looked at a whole bunch of words which talk about redemption. So just to summarize, what are the different ways in which God has purchased us and redeemed us yes redeemed us from the curse of the law so whenever you feel that your life is cursed that nothing is going right that everything is a mess and is there even any hope for your future remember your life is no longer cursed you are under the favor of god you are under the blessing of god never ever regard your life as cursed you have been set free from the curse of the law. The second thing uh, we saw is that a beautiful exchange took place where all of the ammunition of God has been expended upon Jesus. Nothing is left for you now. Now he only has got peace and love and favor towards you because all of the righteousness of God, uh, of Jesus, has now been released to you. So all of the righteousness of God, of Jesus, now belongs to us. And that is how God sees us. Uh, a third thing that we, we saw is that um, we have been restored to our former status. So in the same way Adam and Eve were children of God, we have now been brought out of the dominion of darkness. We have been uh, introduced into God's kingdom. And so now we are his children. We have got back our former status, which we had lost. And we also saw that we have been set free from all wickedness. We do not have to go back into those wicked ways. We can live a holy, victorious life because it says that word over there very plainly, that word lutro is talking about someone who has been set free. Once upon a time, they might have been a captive of that, but now they have been set free from it. 
so they do not have to go back and subject themselves to that to that wickedness to that sinfulness anymore and finally we saw that word that word uh, um, exireo is talking about how we have been rescued from a very dangerous evil age so if we choose to stay rescued if we choose not to go back into that evil world then we can you know have a different future from those people who are headed towards destruction um so these are all the ways in which jesus has redeemed us for himself um we could not really talk much about sanctification today so we will you know um, look into greater detail uh into the concept of sanctification next class but just so that we you know uh, have an idea of the difference between justification and sanctification let's just very quickly look at that the hebrews 10 14 is that one verse in the bible which talks about both justification and sanctification we have touched upon it many times you know but just to repeat it once again if someone could read out for us hebrews 10 14 Hebrews ten fourteen. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So he has perfected forever. We have been declared perfect. We have been declared justified by one offering, by one sacrifice. Jesus has perfected, justified forever those who are being sanctified. So that uh, process of sanctification continues. throughout our lifetime so let's look at the difference between these two so justification is basically our legal status so because you know if you remember our legal indebtedness all our debts were nailed to the cross jesus finished paying the price for all of those debts so now basically it's like as if you have a legal document which says this person does not owe any debts anymore all the debts are cleared this person is now in a right standing with god so your legal status is that you are no longer indebted all your debts have been wiped away you know so uh, legally that is your status of justification but when it comes to your actual everyday life you see that you still have many um unrenewed attitudes you know there may be jealousy there may be greed uh, there may be pride uh there may be evil actions you know where you know you, you may hurt somebody uh, or you may uh, do something which is displeasing to god so at a human level in our everyday walk even though our legal status is that all our sins have now been all our debts have now been cleared at when it comes to practical living we are still going through a process of change so there's a legal status and there is a current everyday status even as we walk we you know with god so justification happens once at the moment of salvation we are justified sanctification on the other hand is something that you go through on a daily basis your entire life you can't say oh now i have become you know good enough i don't need to make any more progress no every day you will have to again take up your cross and follow him so sanctification is something that you will go through for your entire life now justification is something that god did for us he declared and he said this person is righteous in every way the all of jesus righteousness has now been given to this person so therefore i declare this person completely righteous so that was done by god but now for sanctification to happen we would need to cooperate with him so we should make a choice every day to sacrifice those things which are displeasing we need to make a choice to say lord i will not do the things which you are you know asking me to refrain from so we would have to co-op so for sanctification active cooperation on on the part of the believer is required you would have to cooperate with the lord and then um when it comes to justification all of us are equally justified to what extent was billy graham justified he was justified he had the same righteousness as jesus christ what about me i too am equally justified as justified as billy graham is i am also that justified 
when it comes to justification all of us are equally justified because we all have the full righteousness of jesus christ but when it comes to sanctification there are believers who have allowed the lord to sanctify them more and there are some believers who have not who are not allowing the lord to sanctify them so when it comes to sanctification there are people with who are more sanctified and less sanctified and it's our lord's desire that all of us be you know more and more sanctified day by day all right let's just you know quickly close with a word of prayer um lord we just thank you so much for the concepts that we could learn today regarding salvation regarding redemption uh, and we thank you o oh lord that your work of sacrifice on our behalf was complete we have been redeemed o oh lord from the curse we have been redeemed from slavery so lord we can now live in a new way we pray o oh lord that we would understand the privilege which we have been given and we will solemnly work uh, towards honoring you and living in a way which will please you thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you